The call came on a Thursday. Now, for foster parents, the call is when a child welfare agency or a foster care agency calls a foster home and asks if a child could be placed in a home. Children are placed in foster care for various forms of abuse, for neglect, for abandonment. My 17 years as a foster family, my wife and I have seen over 60 children come through our home. We have held babies as young as 27 hours of age in our home, and we've had children as old as 18 years of age. We've adopted three of those children. We've had as many as 11 children in our house at the same time, and I'm not a hotel. We've had as many as seven in diapers, which should be, uh, which should be illegal in all 50 states, I think. We have seen children who have suffered tremendous abuse and who have suffered from great anxiety and great trauma in our house. So on this particular time, uh, my wife was in Australia, where she's from, with our five-year-old son. And I was at home with my eight-year-old daughter and six-year-old daughter. The call came, and I had a number of questions. As a foster parent, I have to determine very, very quickly if my home is the right place for that child. Can I provide the specific resources that she needs? Can I give her the right kind of support that that child needs? Is it a good fit for my family, and is my family a good fit for the child? So I have a number of questions. So I asked the caseworker, how old is the child? She's seven. Why is the child in care? Well, her father's a registered sexual predator. He's raped her over and over again. He can't be found. Mom's a drug addict, can't find mom anywhere. The seven-year-old girl is living with her grandmother, who's an alcoholic, either sleeping on the couch or sleeping on the uh, upstairs bed. The seven-year-old girl is responsible for getting herself fed, clothed, and to school, which she may do about 70% 70, 70 of the time. So I asked, well, how long will she be in care for? Just for the weekend. So after talking to my wife about this in Australia on the phone, I called the caseworker back and said, we would be happy to have this child come spend time with her family. The next day was Friday, and I pulled my girls together and said, girls, remember how scared these children have been when they've come into our home? Now, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine a seven-year-old girl. Perhaps it's your sister. Maybe it's your niece. Maybe it's your daughter or your granddaughter. Maybe it's a friend of the family. But imagine a seven-year-old girl, late at night, without any explanation. Caseworker shows up, perhaps the police. The child is removed from everything she knows. She's taken from her mother. She's taken from her father. Sometimes she's taken from her siblings. She's taken from her stuffed animals, her pets, her toys. She's removed from her bedroom, her house, her home. She's taken from her friends, her family members, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. Her teacher, sometimes a new school. Her students, if she goes to church, church. Everything she knows, late at night, without any explanation, and told this is your new house, this is your new family. So what does that seven-year-old girl do? I'll tell you exactly what she does. She asks these questions. Why am I here? When do I go home? When will I see mommy and daddy next? Is it my fault that daddy comes into my bedroom at night and touches me in those places? Is it my fault that mommy hits me? Did I do something wrong? Do mommy and daddy not love me anywhere anymore? And as I struggle to answer those questions and comfort her, she cries herself to sleep. I have held so many children in my arms as they've cried themselves to sleep over the years. The next morning she wakes up. She doesn't know where the kitchen is. She doesn't know, she doesn't know she's allowed to eat breakfast because food is not common in her house. She goes to a strange school with strange students. She's given math, a book to read, spelling words. She goes to the cafeteria. Everybody's laughing. She thinks they're laughing at her because she's now a foster child. She's walking in the hall. Someone bumps into her. Her books spill everywhere, and she screams out, I want to go home! That is how it is for a child placed in foster care. You can put aside all the abuse and the anxiety and trauma. It is a time of great trauma being placed into a home like mine. They are full of questions. They are afraid and they don't know. So I reminded my girls of that. About an hour later, the caseworker pulled up in front of the house, and my daughters and I walked to the car, and I opened up the door, and I said, hello, my name is Daddy, she said. And I said, oh, hi. She said, I love you. And I said, 
well, I love you too. She looked at my, my daughters, are you my new sisters? I love you, I love you. My girls looked at me like this. I said, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, three weeks later, I went to pick up my wife at the airport. She'd returned from Australia, about a long trip, about 40 hours trip, and she's exhausted, and my son's exhausted. And my wife said, let's just go home. I said, okay. And all of a sudden she heard, mommy, I love you, zoom. And she looked down at her knees at me like this, and I said, long weekend. It was a very long weekend. It was almost two years. Sydney, as I call her, had reactive attachment disorder. Most kids in foster care who have suffered some abuse and trauma, they don't know how to form a healthy attachment with anybody. They don't know how to trust anybody. And they had these attachment disorders. She was a food hoarder. Most children in foster care do not know where their next meal is coming from. They hoard food. She was so far behind academically, she couldn't even write her own name when she came to be placed with us. Kids in foster care, they go from home to home to home and school to school to school, fall further and further behind academically. That's why they're at least a year and a half behind academically. She had behavior problems, she lied so much, but it didn't matter. It did not matter for this was my daughter. This was part of my family and I loved her with all of my heart. So many people say to me, Dr. John, I couldn't do what you do. It would hurt too much to give those kids back. And my response is this. That is exactly how it's supposed to be. That's exactly how it's supposed to be for a foster parent. Children in foster care need stability. They need security. But what they need more than anything else is for somebody to love them with all of our hearts, with all of our hearts, so that when they do leave, for whatever reason it might be, when they do leave, yes, our hearts break. It's like losing a member of my family. It's like losing my own child. Foster parents experience feelings of grief and loss. And I have cried buckets and buckets over the years for these children. But I think that's a wonderful gift. I think that's a gift because my tears, my heartbreak, I might be the first person as a foster parent who has ever loved this child with so much so that when they do leave, I'm giving them a gift of my heart. That broken heart might be that child. I might be the first person who's ever cried for that child, who's ever grieved for that child. And that is a gift. Well, it was December 22nd. Sydney would have, had been with us for almost two years. We had hoped to adopt her. Received a phone call from the child's caseworker. And they said, Dr. John, Sydney's gonna go live with her aunt and uncle in Florida, whom she's met once. I said, but, but we are hoping to adopt her. I understand that the judge says that she needs to be with her family at Christmas time. But we're the only family she's ever known, I said. Only family she's ever known. She's only met them once. No child, no child needs to wake up on Christmas morning surrounded by strangers. Can you imagine? I said, I will wake up Christmas morning. We have all these presents for her. So many children in foster care have never celebrated a birthday or a Christmas or a holiday in their life. I said, so we go to the extreme. So we have all these gifts for her. Let her wake up with the only family she's ever known. I will drive the six hours to Florida there and back on Christmas Day, but let her be with her family. Judge says no. So the next day, December 23rd, my wife is at home in shock. The first stage of grief and loss. And I drove to the child welfare office and I met her aunt, uh, an aunt uncle, and I know, I know this is wrong of me. I know this is wrong of me, I get it, I understand. But I looked at them and I thought, this does not look good, this does not look safe. Judgment, I get it, wrong, I understand. But I was worried. I gave them all of her belongings, all of her presents, everything she owned. I gave Sydney a picture of our family with our names, phone number, and address on the back, which I give to many children. And I held her in my arms and I said, Sydney, I love you, goodbye. 
And two days later on Christmas Day, my wife and I cried deeply. Four years later, I'm packing to go see my mother-in-law in Australia because I've got to go see my mother-in-law sometime, right? <laughs> and I'm packing and the phone rings and I pick up the phone and I said hello and a voice I had not heard in four years said, Daddy, I want to come home. I said, Sydney, is this you? Is this you? Daddy, please let me come home. Sydney, wh what's happened? Tell me, where are you? And she started crying. Daddy, please let me come home. Please let me come home. And I said, Sydney, where are you? And she could not find the words. I said, let me talk to somebody. So she put me on the phone to her foster mother in Alabama. You see, her aunt and uncle's stepson had been raping her over and over again, and they knew about it. And they did not want to get caught. So they took her to the nearest state park in Alabama over state lines, and they deserted her there. And the only thing she had besides the clothes in her back was that picture, their phone number. And she'd been floating from foster home to home to home. I told the foster mother, I said, listen, I'm going away for three weeks, but when I come back, we will go visit her. We'll start to bring her back. We'll start this adoption process. So the foster mother said, she's very difficult. I said, I'm sure she is. I'm sure she is, full of trauma. But it didn't matter. This is my daughter. The entire time I'm in Australia, I kept hearing, Daddy, I want to come home. Please let me come home, Daddy. So that when I do drive home, I don't even unpack the car. I go straight in the house, pick up the phone, and call. And she'd already been moved, and they didn't know where. I spent the next five years looking for her. Phone calls, internet, email, visiting people, letters, Florida, Georgia, Alabama. I don't know where she's at. But I needed her to hear three things, three things before she aged out of the foster care system. You see, when youth age out of foster care system, the statistics are very grim. In some states, it's 21 years of age. In some states, it's 18 years of age. The statistics are this. 55% of youth in foster care will drop out of high school when they age out. 65% of these youth will end up homeless. 75% of these youth will end up incarcerated at some point. And for so many, their own children starts the next generation as the cycle repeats itself. And I needed Sydney to hear three things before that happened. You are important, you are cared for, and you have family that will love you forever. And recently, after five years, I received a text on my phone. It said, call this number. So I pick up the phone and call. I said, hello, this is Dr. John DeGarmo. Dr. John, we've been waiting for you. I said, who is this? This is a director of child welfare. I said, I'm sorry, uh, why, do you know why I called you? She said, yes. And then I felt something. And I said, oh, no. Do you know where she is? She said one word, yes. And I lost it. I could not stop crying. I could not stop crying. I've been looking for five years. A few days later, my wife and I, we had nine kids in the house at the time. We put them in various respite homes, foster care homes. And my wife and I drove to Alabama, and we found her in a children's mental health hospital. It was far worse than anything I could have ever imagined. No one called her. No one wrote her letters. No one visited her cuts everywhere, no reason to live. In her mind, in her mind, we kicked her out of the house on Christmas Day. And in her mind, when she called and said, Daddy, please let me come home, we never came and got her. My wife and I thought, well, do we bring her back home? Do we adopt her? But her therapist and her counselor and her caseworker are all telling us that she can be not only disruptive, but dangerous as around small children. And I have three children of my own that I've adopted who all have their own set of complex challenges before them. And my wife and I recognize that if we brought her home at 18 years of age, it would completely disrupt and maybe even put our children that we'd adopted in danger. And I had a lot of guilt about this. Recently, Sydney has been released from the Children's Mental Health Hospital. They cannot do anything else for her. She's almost 20. She is jobless. She is not past the ninth grade. She's going from home to home. She's just had a baby. 
the foster care system failed my Sydney, and I will not let it happen again. I will not let it happen again. It drives me every single day. We, we cannot let this happen again to any child in our community. On any given day in America, there are roughly 500,000 children in America's foster care system, a system that is in crisis. More children flooding into a system, mainly due to the opiate epidemic that is strangling our nation, and not enough support, and not enough foster homes. And for many of these children who are not finding the support they need, or finding the foster homes they need, they're running away, and they're ending up victims of human trafficking and child sex trafficking. Now, I understand this. Not everybody can be a foster parent. I get it, it's the hardest thing I've done, most rewarding thing I've done, and every child has made me a better person in some way, but it's tough. Not everybody can be a foster parent, but I do know this to be true. Every one of us, every one of us can help a child in foster care in some way. You could become a court-appointed special advocate, a CASA, a volunteer program to help kids in foster care. You could supply school supplies and a backpack filled with hygiene items and stuffed animals and a blanket those first few nights of placement. You can provide new shoes and new, and new clothing. You can provide, uh, you can be a mentor or a tutor to these children. You could teach them important social and living skills before they age out of the system. But each of us can help a child in foster care, and that's just a few of the ways. Now, to be honest, I can't change the world, and you can't change the world. But for these children that you choose to help, for these children, their world is changed. Their world is changed. And years from now, years from now, that child that you helped, they may not remember your name. Years from now, that child you helped, they may not remember your face. But years from now, they'll remember this. That for a time in their life, and maybe the only time in their life, somebody cared about them. Somebody loved them. And that's how we help bring healing to children in crisis. That is how we help children in foster care. Because right now, right this very minute, there's a child who lives near where you live who is hoping and maybe praying, please, somebody help me. Thank you.